Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. You never know what incredible stories might exist in your own backyard. Or just below the surface of Hoosier history across the state. Tonight, explore how a change of perspective can lead to stunning discoveries. Penetrate through the layers of a painting with a revolutionary new camera. Meet a model citizen whose love of a community has reached unexpected heights. Begin a journey with celebrated Hoosier Lou Wallace as he transforms from a controversial soldier to famed author and revel in the eclectic jazz sounds of Indy's Tonos Triad. Hoosiers continue to find new paths from new perspectives. So stay tuned to see the Indiana stories shaping your community. Hello, I'm Daryl Neer. And I'm Erica Sagone. Daryl, I'm excited about this show because we are going to delve into history in some really cool ways. You know, Erica, I'm, I'm excited because when we finish, I think we're going to see Indiana in an entirely different way. Well, technology has allowed researchers to peel back the layers of science and history in unexpected ways. And at the IU Art Museum, conservationists are putting their collections under the microscope. The OSIRIS is an imaging system, basically a camera, but instead of detecting visible light, it detects a light in the infrared range. What happens is that instead of seeing the surface of a painting, the infrared lights penetrate further into the painting and are reflected back off of the light ground. So then what we get is an image that looks through the paint and images the underdrawing and the ground layer of the painting. And we couldn't sample, basically, and get an underdrawing. We can't x-ray and get an underdrawing. You know, really, this is the way that you would do that. There would be really no way for us to do this investigation that we're doing right now with anything else but an Osiris. There were uh, ways to do it with a regular camera and infrared film, uh, but now it's very difficult to find infrared film and it's even more difficult to find someone who can process it. Well, the Osiris has some limitations. If there is a light ground, a normal paint layer, the thicker the paint layer, the harder it is to get it to penetrate. It won't penetrate certain colors. So, you know, almost every exam that we have has some limitations. Because it was developed for outer space, of course, it's a camera with no viewfinder, which kind of complicates getting an image the quality that you like that's in focus. It's done basically based on the size of the painting. You would measure the largest dimension of the painting, and then you would use various graphs that we have uh, to figure out how far the camera needed to be from the painting, and uh, also to set your bellows in and out. So basically, though, you have to take a scan or a partial scan in order to see if you're in the right place. Currently, we're working on a, a project to help authenticate 29 paintings in our collection. It's a relatively unknown artist. We only have one signed painting in his whole oeuvre. He only would sign marine paintings because of the hierarchy. The other, you know, he did landscapes and decorative paintings to pay his bills. But, you know, his idea of great art was, you know, the, the traditional marine painting. Because there's no signatures, we have to work on similarities. So what we're doing is we have infrared photographs of 30 known, accepted, attributed paintings by this artist, Thomas Chambers. And now we are currently doing infrared photography 
of our collection of 29 paintings to see if we can find similarities or differences that would help us move toward an, an attribution for the paintings. One particular painting that we're working on in the Osiris Project is a Thomas Chambers painting called The Wreck of the Bristol in Rockaway, on Rockaway Beach. And it's basically a shipwreck. And it's a very kind of light painting, and, but there's no indication of any underdrawing at all on it visually. Sometimes we have a clue that there's going to be something, but this is just as uh, strictly a paint film with no indication that there's anything under it. It's been our, actually our most uh, successful scan. It's almost a perfect painting uh, as far as the thickness of the paint because we've got an incredible detail of that painting which gives us a bounty of information and we can use that in reference to paintings that have less if we can identify well this is the same loop as we see here and here it broadens what we can uh, determine from a less successful scan one with less information to record. It's like uh, analyzing handwriting, really. It's kind of the same concept. You look for how does he make a cloud formation, or how would he uh, designate that where he wants spraying water, or a wave. All of these things you know, kind of have a, a calligraphy to them. And so by comparing the underdrawing from one set of knowns to our suspected <laughs> collection, we can maybe help identify a specific hand at work. To learn more about the IU Art Museum or current collections on display, visit artmuseum.indiana.edu. Erica, I'm fascinated by the use of technology to uncover the meanings of, of a painting in such dramatically different ways. Yeah, I had no idea that there was so much hidden in, in all the layers, you know, all the things that they have uncovered, all that they're going to uncover, just amazing technology. Well, it's clear that art and history is all around us, sometimes just below the surface. And our next story is something you have to see to believe. The first time I had citizens come in that live in this community, older people, I mean some young ones, they'd walk right up here to, and look down here and the first thing they would see was either a place they knew about, familiar with, lived there, but it just, it blew their mind. They couldn't believe they'd see it. This is Larry Shute's hometown, Salisbury, a tiny rural place in southern Indiana where he's lived his whole life. Or rather, it's a scale model of Salisbury as it looked decades ago in its heyday that Larry built from scratch. There's the Yoho General Store, which is still a treasure today. There's his own childhood home, which is still around too. The enormous tulip trussel, just outside of town. And memorable spots like the feed store, train depot, and Dutch's Cafe, all which closed long ago. It's a model train set to the extreme. It has lights, and sound, and plenty of small town history. I've kind of always modeled things because I couldn't have the real thing. I knew that I could never afford to own a real railroad. So I chose modeling to compensate for that desire, and it worked. Larry began building this precise, incredibly detailed replica in 2006, finding that it combined many things he loved. Salisbury, of course, but also railroads, model trains, and photography. Larry remembers getting his first camera around 1957 and documenting the town, photographing streets and buildings and scenes of everyday life. I did that, but not knowing what I was gonna use it for, I just did it. So I shot probably, I'd say 100 pictures. Anytime there was any kind of thing going to happen that would change the face of the community, I wanted to be sure I had pictures of it before it happened, and then pictures immediately following. Larry was a volunteer firefighter in his community for 50 years. He and his wife had two daughters and raised their family there. He's basically the town historian. 
no one knows Salisbury better than Larry. Over the years, he could sense his beloved town changing. The high school closed, Dutch's cafe shuttered, and other places followed suit. I don't believe I could have gotten any more guidance in life and more knowledge about life anywhere else than here. I didn't want to see this town go away and become something that I wouldn't be proud of. So I had retained all this stuff in my head, if you will, and that's when I decided I wanted to do something to keep this little town alive, at least in my memory. Larry used the photos to piece together the Salisbury he remembered. The photos clued Larry in on the measurements he needed to build everything to scale. New technology like Google Earth let him get even the elevations right. The rest, he filled in the old-fashioned way, by surveying things himself with a measuring wheel. The proudest part of it, I, I guess, is the knowledge that I had in the back of my head that I applied here and helped me make this as accurate as I could. When people would walk in and see a particular thing and, and say to me, oh, there's da 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 da, whatever it would be, then I knew I'd made the mark, you know, I'd scored. So I find that very gratifying. Complimentary, yes, but I didn't do it for that reason. I did it for me, but it turns out I did it right for me. One part that wows is Larry's model of the tulip trestle, the longest train trestle in the country at 2,295 feet long. In real life, the bridge connects Salisbury to the community of Tulip, but in Larry's model, it connects to the fictional city named Shootsbury. Back in Salisbury, it is details from a bygone era that draw you in, like the outhouses and LP gas tanks in the backyards. Gathering all of the details for the model has been a trip down memory lane. I can remember probably 56, I go to the general store up here and they would have the counters lined with Christmas gifts at Christmas time. The cafe, we ate lunch there. It had the best sandwiches in the world ever. Best pies, best milkshakes, all the simple things of life and probably stuff we shouldn't be eating. But it was great. It was great to be a part of that life and a part of that town at that point in time. For Larry, the replica is a labor of love. Nine years after he started building the model, Larry is still adding to it which begs the question, when will it be finished? Probably when I take my last breath. I, just, I can't imagine ever completing it because life is what you make it. And I've always tried to be a part of life, a part of the community. And I've always felt like because they, they being this community, gave me so many things that I wanted to give something back. To learn more about how you can visit the life-size version of Salisbury, including an all-new observation deck at the Tulip Trestle, go to visitgc.com. Daryl, one of the great parts about this story is that Larry actually had a lot of help from the community in building this model. So he had friends and modelers paint the backdrop and weather the trains appropriately and even put tiny little pot bottles inside the Yoho General Store. And what I think is really cool is how this one man's personal experience with Salisbury has such universal appeal and interest. It's, yeah, it's it a really great does. Story. <laughs> Well, WTIU will be premiering its newest documentary this month about Indiana's own Lou Wallace. From being the youngest Major General in the Union Army to the celebrated author of Ben-Hur, Wallace's examination of his own perspectives and experiences helped him become a leading role in America's military, political, and literary affairs during the 19th century. Golden fields of wheat heralded the month of September in 1876 as Civil War General Lew Wallace boarded a train in Crawfordsville, Indiana that would take him to Indianapolis for the Third National Soldiers' Reunion. The train rumbled to life and started its eastward journey leaving the setting sun in its trail. 
Wallace encountered other former soldiers as he passed through the train car. But one in particular left a lasting impression. Robert Ingersoll, who fought under Wallace at Shiloh, was now the nation's most prominent agnostic. He was a renowned orator who toured the country challenging religious beliefs. Ingersoll invited his general to join him in a conversation. As the train continued toward the state capitol, Wallace asked for the right to choose the topic of the exchange, and his themes were all of a religious nature. He gave them to Ingersoll, and here is Lou's description of what happened. I sat spellbound, listening to a medley of argument, eloquence, wit, satire, audacity, irreverence, poetry, brilliant antithesis, and pungent excoriation of believers in God, Christ, and heaven, the like of which I had never heard. <laughs> He vomited forth ideas and arguments like an intellectual volcano. Ingersoll's claims had a potent impact on Wallace. They caused him to analyze his own convictions as never before. It is necessary now to confess that my attitude with respect toward religion had been one of indifference. I had heard it argued times innumerable, always without interest. Yet here was I now moved as never before, and by what? the most outright denials of all human knowledge of God, Christ, heaven, and the hereafter, which figures so in the hope and faith of the believing everywhere. Was the colonel right? He made me ashamed of my ignorance. I was aroused for the first time in my life to the importance of religion. I resolved to study the subject. Wallace called his study an incidental employment, an undertaking that would keep him busy with research for the next four years. The result, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, was published in 1880 and became the best-selling novel of the century. Author John Swansburg wrote, it's one of the great, if little-known, ironies in the history of American literature. Having set out to win another soul to skepticism, Robert Ingersoll instead inspired a biblical epic that would rival the actual Bible for influence and popularity in Gilded Age America. And what did Wallace have to say about his accomplishment? It only remains to say that I did as I resolved with results. First, the book Ben-Hur, and second, a conviction amounting to absolute belief in God and the divinity of Christ. Lou Wallace, Shiloh Soldier, Ben-Hur Bard, premieres on WTIU Monday, November 30th at 8 p.m. For more information, visit WTIU.org forward slash Lou Wallace. Now, Erica, Wallace was so important to Indiana history that at the turn of the 20th century, uh, they commissioned a statue that was unveiled in 1910 at the National Statuary Hall of the United States Congress to Wallace. Yeah, and I believe he's the only novelist in the Statuary Hall, right? He is. Hmm? Well, our latest musical guests have been making waves on the Indianapolis jazz scene for their unique instrumentation and original compositions. Triad is three notes, and that's what makes up a chord for any type of instrument. The band was formed in 2006. They were really trying to create something unique and different. They came up with this whole concept of the accordion, mandolin, and also upright bass. I didn't join until 2012, and it was a really smooth transition. So it just went from there. We're definitely not traditional jazz. Everybody wants to come and be like, what style of music are you? What style of music are you? They call the music jazz pop Euro folk. There's elements of jazz that are in there. There's also just a lot of progressiveness kind of going on to it. Things like the classical guitar. And the pop comes from the melodies. Melody is extremely, extremely important. Whenever I bring something to the table, it can sound really cool. It's like, okay, well, well where's the melody? The melody is what people recognize. So that's how we draw a lot of inspiration. People say like, well, where do you guys play? It's like anywhere and everywhere. All around the Midwest region, 
I have learned a lot about the music business because it is a business. Acting, directing, writing music, performing live. It's all show business. It's all a very similar mentality that you have to have to be successful and to stay relevant and also still be able to be true to yourself. The biggest thing that I learned is that you have to keep doing stuff. You have to keep making yourself relevant because if you're not pushing yourself, there's somebody else out there that has more ambition that will. And once you accomplish something, just don't let yourself get comfortable. In order to do that, I think you just have to celebrate whatever successes that you had, but also keep challenging yourself. I'm always just driven to keep improving. The music that I make is my, is my legacy. In the next five years, nobody knows what's gonna happen. There's people who are interested in the group, especially for TV and film music, because our music fits really well with that. We're also interested in pursuing a recording contract. When we do gigs and tours, each of those will just get better and better. The thing is, though, with any band, you just never, you never know. As much as you try, you know, you just never quite know what what the next what the next thing's going to be And now Tonos Triad Guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, to hear more original jazz compositions by Tonos Triad, or to learn how you can see them live, visit tonostriad.com. And as always, explore your area by visiting weeklyspecial.org for stories from your own backyard. Well, Daryl, we got a lot of really wonderful history lessons on tonight's show, and they were my kind of history lessons because they were, they were a little different. I love the stories that allow us to see Indiana from a different perspective. Yep. That's all the time we have for this evening, but before we go, let's hear one more time from Tono's Triad. Good night.
Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 